You're listening to To Succeed, Just Let Go, a podcast that'll change how you think and change your life. I'm Willie Horton and I'm a psychologist, been helping people change their lives since 1996. Broadcasting from the French Alps, I'm delighted to have you along. Let's take this week's step in the right direction. If, like many people, every Thursday morning since 2008, you receive into your inbox my weekly free video, quick tip and reflection. You'll know that they are accompanied by a normal crazy people story. Now over the years people have wondered, am I laughing at normal crazy people? Why am I putting negative stuff in a weekly offering that is so, so positive? And I suppose there are a couple of reasons. The first one of which is that, you know, an awful lot of people who write in the personal development or self-help or psychology sphere, they're awful dry. Uh, We need a little bit of laughter in our lives. In fact, we need a lot of joy in our lives. We've been talking about that over the last few weeks and months at this stage. And, you know, faced with the choice of despairing of normal crazy people's behaviour, or being entertained by it, I think it's always probably the better option to laugh rather than cry. So, every Thursday, my normal crazy people story brings a little levity to the party. But that is not the reason why normal crazy people stories appear most weeks. You and I are faced with choices moment to moment, day to day. Uh, And an awful lot of the time we think the choices that are really important are the ones that our poor, sad, normal, crazy thinking minds have decided are important. Whereas actually the really important stuff takes place in the nitty gritty, the cut and thrust, the rough and tumble of the here and now. And therefore the choices that we have to make moment to moment, day to day, are actually the little ones that lead to us being in the right state of mind to be able to make the big choices, make the big decisions effortlessly. Now, normal crazy people's stories are in your face to present you with a choice between being focused or unfocused, present or all over the place, mindful or mindless. When we use our minds normally, we are bound to be crazy. In fact, the way in which cognitive psychology tells us that the normal mind works on automatic pilot is a classic definition, possibly the classic definition, of crazy. If I'm normal, I'm operating on autopilot. That autopilot is designed to enable me make it through the day. That autopilot, to enable me make it through the day, runs on programs that I learned in my formative years, the key ones being learned in the third year of my life. So when I am operating on autopilot, trying to make sense of what is going on now so that I can act appropriately, actually what I do is refer back to a past long gone that has no relevance whatsoever to the here and now, other than the fact that it will enable me struggle through the day and survive it, but it has no relevance to my understanding of what is going on and therefore has no impact on me making the right choices and doing the right things. Quite the opposite. If I'm sitting here in 2021 at 62 and a half years of age, and the half's important by the way, I am, if I'm using my mind normally, trying to make sense of now based on stuff that I learned primarily in 1960. There isn't a hope in hell that I will know what's going on in the here and now. And if I do happen to figure out what's actually going on, it'll be dumb luck. And it'll actually be almost an aberration as far as my automatic mind is concerned. And perhaps the biggest reason that it might be an aberration from the perspective of my automatic pilot is that it might actually take me off my automatic rails, take me outside my comfort zone, put me in harm's way, so that when I'm confronted by 
Oh no, it's the 21st century. There are no man or woman eating tigers. That is why normal crazy people stories appear every Thursday morning. They put the choice that you and I have in your face. Because that choice has to be made now. And the minute you make that choice now, you set yourself up for a different now, now. And one of the most interesting things of understanding in the here and now that you are surrounded by normal crazy people is that you now know what to expect of them and what not to expect of them. Many years ago, I sat down for the first time with a, an individual who has become a long-standing client uh, head of HR in the family business and at the end of our first day together he said to me you've made my job so much easier now I know what I'm dealing with I'm dealing with normal crazy people no wonder they behave the way they behave now that I know what I'm dealing with I can change my expectations I can change the way I try to engage with them I can actually do the things I need to do to get all of us to where we want to go little by little by little <laughs> and, uh, and that's the, the interesting thing with normal crazy people you have to approach them little by little by little I had a call a couple of weeks ago from another long-standing client who said to me that a couple of his family and uh, closer friends would really benefit from what I do how should he broach the subject with them and my answer is you know the old expression that you can only lead a horse to water. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, in this case, you can't even lead the horse to water. People are going to have to make up their mind for themselves that they need to bring about change in their life. And the one sure and certain way that they will bring down the shutters and put up their defences is if you start telling them how they should go about making change in their life. Oh, the effrontery of you, that you would actually say to them, hold on a minute, you're a normal crazy person. Now, obviously, you can't go around saying that kind of thing. So it is little by little by little, baby steps, one step at a time. But sure, aren't you and I on the same journey from being normal crazy people, little by little, one step at a time. And the interesting thing is, from the perspective of both of the clients that I've just mentioned. They've begun to notice normal crazy people's behaviour changing ever so slightly. People, the real them, the real, the real people coming out of their shell. Not as a result of them guiding them, not as a result of them saying to them, oh, you need to make some changes in your life or you're not behaving appropriately, but actually by simply being there. The hallmark of a great leader is presence. Uh, now I think we all know that because we know people who have presence and we know people who are the exact opposite. Run a mile from those people if you can. And if you can't, make sure that you've suitably reinforced your armour of presence of mind to deal with people like that. But to come back to the point. We all know people who have presence. We all know people who lift us. We all know people in whose presence we like to spend time. Presence isn't something you're born with. Actually, that's wrong, by the way. Presence is something you're born with because up to the age of three years, we are completely and utterly present all the time. It's only what happens us during the third year of our lives when we realize we have to manipulate and move other people around the place to get what we want out of life. It only what, it's only what happens in the subsequent seven years up to the onset of puberty that takes us away from our natural state of being fully present in the moment. And we've talked before about this. There are very good evolutionary reasons, or at least there were very good evolutionary reasons seven or 8,000 years ago, why we shouldn't be present in the here and now. Because if we were fully present, enjoying the moment, we'd be off our guard for that man or woman eating tiger that is no longer stalking us. So, so we actually are born with presence and then we lose it. We're all born leaders and then we lose it. The system, our education system, the way in which we're brought up, the little things that are said to us, the little things that are done to us that knock the stuffing out of us, knock 
our true nature out of us, or actually just suppress our true nature. But the key point I want to make is we all know people who have presence and we all like to spend time with people who have presence. Relearning how to be present is simple and anybody can do it. Uh, I'll quote John Kabat-Zinn of the University of Massachusetts Medical School on this one. A number of people have said to me over the years and indeed over the last week, oh I can't meditate. And John Kabat-Zinn says if you can breathe you can meditate. Anybody can turn their mind back on. So presence isn't some magical fairy dust that some people have sprinkled over them. Presence is a present state of mind. Presence is turning up to the here and now. Presence is paying attention to the here and now. And that is a world removed from somebody who is using their minds in the here and now to make their way through the here and now, to negotiate and manipulate their way through the here and now by reference to stuff that they learned, in my case, in 1960. That's the difference. And it is a world of difference. And because presence is something that obviously only happens in the present, that's what presence actually means, you have a choice in this present. That's the choice I was talking about earlier on. You have a choice to be mindful, to be present, or to be mindless. Missing in action. Wondering why life is a struggle. Wondering why you're suffering from stress. Wondering why everything you touch turns to dust. Wondering why you're not going to take another chance because you know it'll be another failure. And the only reason we keep thinking those thoughts is we keep thinking those thoughts. They are the thoughts that run the automatic pilot. They are the thoughts that have been our old friends since we were three years old. It's worth considering for a moment how we waste our lives when we are in normal crazy mode. I read an article a couple of years ago about somebody who has literally wasted the rest of his life by having an argument with a fellow old age pensioner in a supermarket car park over a parking space. They came to blows, one of them fell, hit his head, the other is doing time for manslaughter. Now, that's kind of an extreme example of normal crazy behaviour. Or is it because we are doing damage to those around us all of the time when we stab people in the back, when we gossip about them, when we take delight in other people's misfortune, where we wish for other people's misfortune. And you might say to yourself, well, I don't do any of these things. It might be no harm if any of us were to hold a mirror up to ourselves and say, how did I spend the last day? Did I take delight in a bit of bad news? Did I have a good laugh at something that some normal crazy people had done or something that had befallen a normal crazy person? Did I spend time gossiping? Did I waste time reading what passes for news? Because about four-fifths of what passes for news these days is opinion about news, and the other fifth is news coloured by the opinion of the person who is writing about the news. There's no such thing, we, you know, we, we've heard over the last couple of years that we live in a post-truth world. But the fact of the matter is that the truth of you and the truth of the life that you can live and the truth about the reality of the moment, the truth about what is going on in this world of ours is only to be discovered by you turning up to the here and now because this is where truth is because this is where reality is. Let me explain. A normal crazy person operating on autopilot has their perspective of reality. They genuinely think it is reality. There are people who think that if you get the Pfizer vaccine, which I I'm just about to go out to get, you will be injected with a microchip that will track your movements. That is their reality. That, that rather extreme example of normal crazy madness shrouds 
the even madder stuff that's actually going on moment to moment, day to day. Somebody pulls out in front of you in traffic or skips the queue in a supermarket at the checkout and you lose your temper, you lose the head, you start shouting and screaming. I see it all the time. We see it all the time around here, particularly people who are on their holidays, so stressed out about enjoying themselves. They'll pick a fight with anybody. They'll pick a fight most often with their nearest and dearest. And if there's nobody around, they'll pick a fight with themselves. Now, you might say that is strange and weird. I was going to say wonderful as well. There's nothing wonderful about it. But you're picking a fight with yourself all the time. Again, hold that mirror up to yourself and consider this question. How often over the last 24 hours have I had a discussion with myself? How often have I had a protracted discussion with myself? How often have I beat myself up? How often have I tripped myself up? How often have I ended up having an argument with myself? How often have I belittled myself? You see, what's going on in the normal mind is we're constantly referencing what's really going on using what we think is going on and what we thought has been going on every day since we took on board the beliefs about who we are, or actually who we think we are, and how we think the world works. Everything, absolutely everything, is filtered through our own opinion. I said a moment ago that the fifth of news that is actually written as news is filtered through the opinion of who is writing it. A normal person will filter everything through their own opinion and most importantly their own opinion of themselves. This is the real handicap that we're all walking around with. This is the real debilitation that takes us away from our own lives. We have such a low opinion of ourselves. And by the way, if you have a really high opinion of yourself as a result of things that happened to you or for you when you were young and impressionable, it still has nothing to do with today. It's still just an opinion. It's still just an impression. It's still just a body of thought built up from what happened, particularly, as I said, during the most formative year of your life, the third year of your life. Let's be a little harder on ourselves, because I think it is required. I've used the word opinion, but let's go one step further and talk about judging. We're constantly judging. And again, it all comes back down to how we judge who we think we are. Now, on the basis that we learned all this stuff decades ago, we're not even judging. We are constantly pre-judging. When we turn up to any moment, we have already pre-judged the situation. That has already created our chain reaction that normally makes things worse rather than better. And all this confirms to us that our pre-judgments were right in the first place. We're all prejudiced people. And again, most importantly, I have deep-seated prejudices about me. All of these things happen in the present moment. Everything happens in the present moment. Nothing happened in the past. The past was a set of present moments. Nothing will happen in the future. The future is a set of moments yet to come. The innermost you, your subconscious mind, only computes present only understands the present tense, doesn't understand the arrow of time. Apparently moves from past through present into the future. Everything's only happening now. I prejudge now. I might worry about something that hasn't happened yet, but I'm doing it now because everything is happening now. And if I'm stupid enough to worry about something that hasn't happened yet, and bear in mind, worry about it through my prejudices, which means I'm millions of miles removed from reality. I've actually taken myself so far away from the here and now that I am bound with a bit of luck to make it through the day, survive and live to just do the same thing all over again in some other now. 
everything happens now. And that means that if I'm prejudging myself now, if I'm continuing to haul around this warped opinion of myself now, it is an opinion of me now. It isn't an opinion of me when I was three. And the stuff that happened to me when I was three that gave me my opinion of me now is, as far as my subconscious mind is concerned, happening to me again now. So in other words, somebody did something to me when I was three, or maybe five or six or seven, and I'm stupid enough to keep doing it to myself. That's why normal crazy people appear every Thursday alongside my quick tip, my free video, and my reflection. We need to keep this in our face. We need to keep reminding ourselves that we need to keep reminding ourselves that we need now to do something about turning up to now. And that means that we don't need to think about the past. It's interesting. I have a, a probably half a dozen clients at this stage who, when I met them first, were psychoanalysts, people who would sit their clients down, or often lie them down, to help them relive their past. <laughs> Think about the madness of it. As I said, that handful of clients that were psychoanalysts when I met them first are no longer psychoanalysts. One of them stopped being a psychoanalyst the very first week I met him. He said, what am I doing to people who come to me for help? I'm torturing them. I'm helping them go back and wallow. You don't need to understand your past to live in the present. There's nothing here to fix. There's nothing broken. You only think you're broken. You only think there are bits of you that need to be fixed. And those thoughts that give rise to this opinion of yourself, this prejudice about yourself, are just your giving energy again and again and again to something that happened once or maybe a couple of times in the past that stuck with you. And it isn't even your prejudice or your opinion that you're living with. You're living with stuff that other people did to you who were prejudiced and opinionated too. The choice to live your life to the full is a choice you take now. Yeah, we're on a journey and we all know that every journey must be taken one step at a time. But there aren't big steps that we need to challenge ourselves to take to go on that journey. We just need to take a small step. And the small step is taken now. What am I thinking? How am I thinking? What am I thinking about myself? How do I feel about myself? These are often the precursors to beginning to understand that really the choice I have to make in life now is a no-brainer. You know, I was talking to a client a couple of days ago who had, in advance of one of our sessions, sent me a printout of her Insights Discovery findings. She had done the Insights Discovery program, one of these personality tests. And I said to her for a start, why did you send me that? And she said, ah, just to annoy you. She said, because you told me a few months ago that when somebody else mentioned a personality test to you, they told you that your voice had raised by a number of decibels. <laughs> My blood pressure had probably gone up as well. Because personality tests push you in a box, and everything we're trying to do in life is release us from the box that actually isn't there. The box we only think is there. Our thoughts have had us in a box since we were young and impressionable, and we'll only discover who we are when we realise there is no box. So why? Why, why would you put any store in saying, oh, I'm fiery red or I'm cool blue, when you're none of those things? A personality test measures, guess what? Your personality. And your personality is what? It is what modern cognitive psychology calls your conceptual self. And there's a hint in the first word of that name as to what your conceptual self actually is. It's a bundle of concepts and it has nothing to do, believe you me, it has nothing to do with who you really are.
But, as I said to my friend a couple of days ago, I said the one good thing about a personality test is that when it comes to normal crazy people, it may be the first time in their lives that they considered how they behave themselves or what they think about themselves. And as I said a moment ago, very often the first tentative steps we take now on the journey to the life that we can live without any bounds, without any limitations, the first steps we often take are to consider what do I think about myself? How do I feel about myself? What do I think of my behaviour today? How do I think I've spent my time today? And that is why I said to you, if for no other reason than to remind yourself that you have a choice between being present and being a normal crazy person, we need to hold a mirror up to ourselves again and again and again. We need to be constantly evaluating and re-evaluating. This is not to analyse or to think. It's thinking that gets us into trouble in the first place, leading to overthinking, leading to thinking the same thoughts again and again and again, leading to continually confirming that we are right to be opinionated and prejudiced in the first place. This is not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about constantly challenging yourself to stay on your toes, to be in the present, to recognise when you're not in the present, and rather than saying to yourself, oh damn it, I wasn't in the present, or get annoyed with yourself, or feel guilty with yourself, or waste the rest of the day annoying yourself that you weren't in the present for a couple of minutes, rather than doing any of that nonsense, when you realise you haven't been in the present, you take a couple of nice, long, slow, deep breaths, and be. Or you run your hand along the table top at which you're sitting, get in touch with reality and come back to the here and now. Over the last few days I've had in-depth conversations one-to-one -one with clients about the big decisions that they have to make in their lives or about the big decisions that they think they have to make in their lives. And again and again I have made the point to them that myself and most of the people with whom I've worked know that when it comes to making what look to others like big decisions, they're just something obvious that you need to do. The next step, little step, you need to take on the journey to the life you would love to live. And they get to that point not by sweating over the big decisions. The big decisions look after themselves. When you look after the little decisions in the here and now. Am I here? Am I present? How am I feeling? How do I feel about my behaviour so far today? What am I going to do now? Am I going to continue being divorced from the here and now through my behaviour or my thought or my prejudice or my opinion? Or am I going to take a couple of deep breaths, press the reset button and make a, the most important decision you will ever make in your life now? And now. And now. Talk about putting your best foot forward and taking another step in the right direction. You've been listening to To Succeed, Just Let Go. To get involved, join me in my Facebook group, strangely enough called To Succeed, Just Let Go. And for more information, visit wwwwilly 